Welcome, everybody. My name is Marty Mascari. I'm with the North Central Texas Area Agency on Aging. I'm actually a contractor in the North Central Texas Aging and Disability Resource Center, or ADRC, both of which are under the umbrella of the North Central Texas Council of Governments in the greater Dallas-Fort Worth, Texas area. We are absolutely blessed once again to have our partners at James L. West here to talk about um, a stress and the brain. And um, But before we do, we're first going to talk about CEUs. If we could get you to share, that would be good. I know I didn't catch it. I they, thought I was doing you, something, but well, here I, we go. I didn't it's catch it. Until, I didn't catch it until I got to the point where I was like, "Oh, I got to do this." Or, or I, I guess I, I need to let Jamie do this first. So yeah. Jamie, you go right ahead. So Jamie Top Tinsley with um, James L. West. Go ahead. Thank you, Marty. And we are um, happy to provide CE credits for social work, licensed counselors, nursing, and a certificate of attendance. We are able to provide one and a half um, hours for this program. Marty will be sending out a follow-up link through SurveyMonkey. And we ask that everybody complete our program evaluation because we really appreciate your feedback and we use that as we plan programs for the rest of the year. But if you are requesting CE credits, you are required to complete the evaluation. Um, and you will, if you'll give us about four weeks from the date that the evaluation closes. So we will keep the evaluation open until the end of the day on January the 18th. And then about four weeks from after that, we'll process all of those certificates and get them to you by email. Thank you. Please understand that you guys, that, that is a pretty tedious process in dealing with the CEUs. Um, please, you know, if, if you could wait till after that, um, that four weeks expires before your, um, you're um you're you're writing to check up on them. I get some emails usually every time, um right after we get done, um within 15 minutes I'll get a thing. What I, I what do I do to get CEUs? You know um so if you could please um please get to, to that survey monkey get through as quick quick as you can and um and then please I don't know put a note on your calendar or something um because it does take about four weeks to get those out. Um in addition to the CEUs um the the survey monkey there will be a google survey that pops up as you close out today it should give you the option to go there and if not that will also be in the follow-up email we ask that you um would complete that because that again helps us um track um some of the goals and objectives we set forth when we applied for funding to do these so i'm gonna jamie do you want to do you want to introduce holly or i can introduce holly or go ahead i'm gonna let you talk about holly <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to, happy to. We are um, the James L. West Center. Part of our, our huge part of our mission is we take care of persons impacted by dementia, and we do that through a variety of services. And one of the ways we do that is through education and resources. And Holly Glover is our director of education and support, family support here at the West Center. She's also a licensed counselor and dementia expert, so she's the best person to talk to, talk to us about stress and depression on brain health. Thank you, Holly. Thank you. Well, those of you who were on a little bit early today, you may have seen that I I did not change my date on there. I did just update this last night and this morning. So many new things have come out about stress and depression on brain health. So we are going to jump right in. I found some great new uh, things from when we have talked about this in the past. Glad y'all are here with us to start the new year. We do this uh, once a month with Marty, so we hope that we'll be seeing you throughout the rest of the year as well. Some of the things that we can do, let's, we're gonna talk about stress and how it affects the brain first, then we'll go over to depression and how it affects the brain. And all of these are gonna lead to, because again, we are a dementia care specialist, how there's now proof, research, science behind some of these things can end up leading to dementia later on. So first, let's start with stress. We all have stress. Oh my goodness, we're going to talk about good stress and bad stress, but stress is part of our daily lives. It comes up each and every day, but it comes up in a variety of forms. It could be stress just from our daily commitments that we have. It could be from our family, our work, our church, our friends, all of those things, whenever we study, if we were together right now, I would probably say, tell me the 10 things in your life that have brought you the most pleasure. And we'd list those over here. And most of the time people say, well, when I graduated college and I got that new job, when I got married, when I got engaged, when the kids were born, when I retired, 
And then we can go over and say, let's talk about the 10 things that have brought you the most stress in your life. That job, that spouse, those kids retiring, it's the very same list. All of those things that bring us pleasure many times are the very things that bring on a lot of stress. We can have an awful lot of stress surrounding money, our health, the health of a loved one, or our relationships. But no matter where the stress comes from, our body either senses it as a real or as a perceived threat, and it goes into action. We start to dump cortisol, we start to dump adrenaline, and we will go into fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. Fawn is when we're trying to please people and avoid conflict. Because our body and mind is trying to deal with whatever's happening and what's causing the response. So let's look at some of these on this chart. And Marty has already put the link to the slides in the chat. You will get them again. You'll also get them when you get the follow-up email. But I want us to look at all of the different things stress does to our body. And we're going to land particularly on this first one where it says head because of issues with mood, anger, depression, irritability, sadness, lack of energy, swings in appetite, where we're either gorging food or we don't want to eat at all, concentration problems, sleeping issues, headaches, pain, mental health issues, anxiety disorders, and panic attacks. And that's just what it does with our head. Look at all of these other things. Stress affects our skin, our joints, and our muscles where we have tension. I want you to think of something tonight when you wake up. We talk about this in my support groups a lot. When you wake up in the night, are your shoulders up here? Are you sleeping and your shoulders are up here because you aren't even relaxed in your sleep? Notice it. Because a lot of people who are under a tremendous amount of stress, particularly caregivers, their shoulders just start staying up because of the stress. Stress affects our heart, increases blood pressure, heartbeat, cholesterol. There go our chances of strokes and heart attacks. Another place stress will show up is in our stomach. Irritable bowel syndrome is going to come up again because as we dump cortisol, our digestive system stops because our body thinks it's time for fight, flight, freeze, fawn. And then we develop that series of constipation, diarrhea, constipation, diarrhea. The pancreas is listed on here, our intestines, reproductive system, and finally, our immune system. Where we get to where we don't have the reserves to fight off illness. I hear caregivers say an awful lot, it's like I can't get over this cold. I can't seem to push through this, whatever it might be, because I don't have the reserves anymore. My immune system is reduced because of stress. So as far as stress and brain health, you're going to see the words in here, and I hate this term, but working as a therapist, being a counselor, we are going to see the term mental illness. I really wish we would just call that brain health because there's a stigma to mental illness. We don't mind talking about our heart health, about cardiac health. People share all the time. I'm on blood pressure medicine, cholesterol medicine, whatever it might be. People don't want to talk about an antidepressant, an anti-anxiety, or something they're doing for their mental health. So even though technically it does fall under that umbrella of mental health, I like saying it's brain health. Why don't we just talk about our brain? Our brain reacts to stress like we just saw. Some of it's good, some of it's bad. But it's all designed to help protect us from what we perceive as a threat. Now, I'll use that word perceive several times as we talk 
today because what I perceive as a threat and what you perceive as a threat may be different because our past is different. Where we live is different. Our experiences are different. Stress can be good. And we'll look at when stress is good because it can sharpen our mind. It can improve our ability to remember details. We're going to look at that particularly. But it can also contribute to mental illness. It's actually been shown, and we're going to look at some scans, to shrink the volume of the brain over time if we live in a state of chronic stress. So I want you to look at some facts that I found in an article from Molecular Psychiatry. It found that chronic stress, which is prolonged and just as a constant feeling of stress, resulted in long-term changes in the brain. Now think about what that's going to do. It's going to make us more prone to mood and anxiety disorders. It also plays a role in depression. It plays a role in other emotional disorders. And then that final bullet point, this was part of the research. It found that stress creates more myelin producing cells, but fewer neurons than normal. Now what that is, this is a substance that surrounds the nerve cells and it insulates them and it increases the rate the impulses are passed to each other. So what difference does that make? Let's look at what else it says. It interferes with the timing of communication. It has negative effects on the hippocampus. All right. Now, those of you who've been watching our videos or following all of our education that we do, there's that term hippocampus. And the hippocampus is what converts information from our short-term memory to our long-term memory. The hippocampus also has that spatial memory. So if we're under a whole lot of stress, think about some of the things that you might do when you're under a lot of stress. The timing of communication. I walked out of this room to go do what? Let's see, what was I going to do? Why did I come in here? Okay, I'm at the store. What was it? What was I going to buy? I know there were three things. I can only, you see what I'm talking about. Timing of communication. I just had it and now it's gone. Stress. Where are my glasses? Where are my keys? More ways that stress affects the brain. Concentration, that's huge. It can make us difficult to remain concentrated. What is it that I'm doing? I better go do this over here. Our thoughts are just racing. Staying focused on one thing at a time. Mood. You're not in a good mood. You're overly emotional. You're crying very easily. Or you may feel like you're just not yourself. Or others may see you. Something's going on. Something's not right. I mentioned the forgetfulness. We can all be absent-minded, like it says. But when you start to forget appointments or you lose things on a regular basis, somebody who's under a tremendous amount of stress, we're also going to see this when we switch over and start talking about depression, this can mimic dementia. Now, we also know now it can lead to dementia, but early on it can mimic dementia. This is why we can still treat and do things about it and reverse it. Irritability. I'm under a lot of stress, so I'm snapping at people. I'm crabby. I'm honking my horn a lot more. I'm walking around with a scowl or a frown or a furrowed brow. Depression falls under this umbrella of stress and so does anxiety now when i'm talking with caregivers i talk an awful lot about depression is when we tend to land in the past 
and we think a lot about what I would have, could have, or should have done. We need to recognize the past. We need to grieve the past, but we can't land there and stay. And then anxiety, on the other hand, is when we land in the future. What if? What's going to? What's around the corner? And we know with dementia, when we have a loved one that has dementia, we've got to stay in the present. Let's look some more at stress and how it ch actually changes the brain structure. And we're again, we're going to look at some photos and we're going to watch a, a short video on this in just a minute. They've been able to show that people who suffer from PTSD and have chronic stress actually have imbalances in the gray and white matter of the brain. And I've put both of these in the middle of the slide. The gray matter is the neurons and cells responsible for that higher order thinking, such as decision making and problem solving. The white matter communicates information from one region of the brain to another. There's that communication again. Now, I put these last two bullet points in bold because I want you to hear this. This is from a psychologist, and she has suggested that only bad stress impacts the brain in this way. Good stress, the type that helps us perform well in the face of a challenge, that's good stress, helps us in a positive way, and it actually leads to resilience, which is a good thing. So our brain becomes either very vulnerable from bad stress or very resilient based on the pattern of the white matter. So let's look at some graphics here. Three main areas that we want to look at when we're talking about brain health and stress. First is this prefrontal cortex. And what's there? Our decision-making, working memory, self-regulatory behaviors, mood and impulses, I always call it our filter is right there. Prefrontal cortex. That's where we snap a little bit quicker. We might say or do things we wouldn't normally say or do when we're under a lot of stress. There's the hippocampus again. Memory of daily events. Spatial memory. Mood regulation. And then, of course, the amygdala is going to be affected because that's where our feelings and our emotions, anxiety, fear, aggression, those are the three main areas. We also know that stress actually kills brain cells. There was a study that was done and they found that in a single 20 minute stressful situation, neurons in the hippocampus died. They concluded that stress didn't impact the ability to create new neurons. It impacted the ability of those new neurons to survive. And then Dr. Daniel Peterson has concluded that antidepressants may help those vulnerable new neurons live. And we'll talk more about antidepressants when we switch over to depression. Stress actually shrinks the brain. A study out of Yale discovered that even among healthy people, stress can lead to shrinkage in areas of the brain associated with the regulation of, here it is again, emotions, metabolism, self-control, and memory. Start to see the link. Memory and stress. They concluded that it's the chronic everyday stress that's intense and traumatic that contributes to the change, not the sudden intense stress of a natural disaster, a car accident, or even the death of a loved one. So make sure that you heard that. It's the day-to-day -day intense stress that's causing this damage, not the sudden stress. It's that sudden stress, the natural disaster, the car accident, that, that is helping to build the resiliency. 
But what happens in this day-to-day -day stress is it becomes a snowball. The next event happens and we don't have any reserves to pull from. We have no reserves to pull from because of the frailty of our emotions. Stress is also really destructive to our memories. We mentioned earlier those that we all do at one time or another, my keys, my glasses, my phone, my car, where did I park? That's the ability to recall the location of objects. The location of objects in the environment. Now, we should be able to backtrack, and it might not come right to us, but we should be able to backtrack and figure out where the keys are, where the car is. The high levels of cortisol, when we're dumping cortisol all the time because of stress, it's directly related to short-term memory loss. That's why I was saying earlier, Stress and depression both can mimic dementia. Now, it also can turn into full-blown dementia. We'll talk about that more. It's interesting that the timing of stress is going to come into play because memory can be enhanced by stress. Let's think if you've ever been in something like a really a car accident, or maybe you had a pretty severe fall or you watched someone have a fall or some type of an accident. Many times people who are witness to something will say it happened in slow motion. It enhanced their memory as they dumped the cortisol and the adrenaline as they were watching something happen or it was happening to them. And they may remember every second of it. It can happen during trauma and our memory holds on to that and it slows down time. That feeds right into the last bullet point here. Memory retrieval is often impeded by those who undergo tremendous stress as a child and they can become repressed memories leading up to PTSD. It is our body's response to a situation that we deem, we perceive as stressful. There's a statistic from caregiver.org that says that about 60% of all caregivers of those with dementia say that they feel like they are under a tremendous amount of stress at one time or another. I actually think that is very low. I think people weren't necessarily being honest or they didn't understand, you know, what do I call a tremendous amount of stress? What do you call a tremendous amount of stress? Because I deal with caregivers every day, day in and day out, and I haven't met one yet that didn't stay, say they weren't under an awful lot of stress. Some of the symptoms, some of the physical symptoms that we, we may have from stress can be a pounding heart, starting to sweat, our muscles tensing up. Remember I mentioned those shoulders coming up, up, up. Fatigue and irritability. The Alzheimer's Society now has even found a link between those with PTSD, long-term stress, and then dementia later in life. There was a very large study done in Denmark, and it was found that one out of five people who had decades of stress, so lifelong stress, later developed dementia. When I talk with families and I'm trying to get a family story, because we now know we are moving from person-centered care to trauma-informed person-centered care. We've got to know about a person's past to give them the best person-centered care. And I have families start telling me stories 
of trauma after trauma after trauma. And now we're finally getting some research behind decades of stress leading to dementia. And again, we're going to look at some scans. I'm actually going to show you some brain scans that are going to show the changes that happen in the brain. Now, some of the things that we can do, and I know it sounds a whole lot easier than it is to actually do it. We know what to do. Balance and manage our responsibilities. Eat a healthy diet, Mediterranean-based diet. There is a diet called the MIND, M-I-N-D, diet. It is a combination of the Mediterranean-based diet and the DASH diet, which is for high blood pressure, hypertension, regular productive sleep, exercise, remaining social. Do those brain games. Take care of your brain. Lifestyle changes. Counseling. We're going to talk about different types of counseling and relaxation techniques. So on a day like we've had in Fort Worth, the last, I don't know, there's been several days where it's just been gloomy and overcast or rainy. One of the things that I use, I've got it right here, because we're going to talk in a minute about something called seasonal affective disorder, is light therapy. And I actually have a light sitting right here on my desk. And it's this one is called a happy light. And we'll talk, we're going to talk more about this when we get to depression. Also things like aromatherapy. I've got tea tree going in my diffuser right now. There are small things that we can do that can help us with stress and depression that really, really do make a difference. At this point, I want us to watch this video. It's put out by Ted Ed, one of my favorite things, Ted Talks. Uh, as some of you know, I am determined I'll be giving a TED Talk at some point. We're going to watch this one on how chronic stress affects your brain. About three, four minutes. Are you sleeping restlessly, feeling irritable or moody, forgetting little things and feeling overwhelmed and isolated? Don't worry. We've all been there. You're probably just stressed out. Stress isn't always a bad thing. It can be handy for a burst of extra energy and focus, like when you're playing a competitive sport or have to speak in public. But when it's continuous, the kind most of us face day in and day out, it actually begins to change your brain. Chronic stress, like being overworked or having arguments at home, can affect brain size, its structure, and how it functions, right down to the level of your genes. Stress begins with something called the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis, a series of interactions between endocrine glands in the brain and on the kidney, which controls your body's reaction to stress. When your brain detects a stressful situation, your HPA axis is instantly activated and releases a hormone called cortisol which primes your body for instant action. But high levels of cortisol over long periods of time wreak havoc on your brain. For example, chronic stress increases the activity level and number of neural connections in the amygdala, your brain's fear center. And as levels of cortisol rise, electric signals in your hippocampus, the part of the brain associated with learning, memories, and stress control, deteriorate. The hippocampus also inhibits the activity of the HPA axis. So when it weakens, so does your ability to control your stress. That's not all though. Cortisol can literally cause your brain to shrink in size. Too much of it results in the loss of synaptic connections between neurons and the shrinking of your prefrontal cortex, the part of your brain that regulates behaviors like concentration, decision-making, judgment, and social interaction. It also leads to fewer new brain cells being made in the hippocampus. This means chronic stress might make it harder for you to learn and remember things, and also set the stage for more serious mental problems like depression and eventually Alzheimer's disease. The effects of stress may filter right down to your brain's DNA. An experiment showed that the amount of nurturing a mother rat provides its newborn baby 
plays a part in determining how that baby responds to stress later in life. The pups of nurturing moms turned out less sensitive to stress because their brains developed more cortisol receptors, which stick to cortisol and dampen stress response. The pups of negligent moms had the opposite effect, and so became more sensitive to stress throughout life. These are considered epigenetic changes, meaning that they affect which genes are expressed without directly changing the genetic code. And these changes can be reversed if the moms are swapped. But there's a surprising result. The epigenetic changes caused by one single mother rat were passed down to many generations of rats after her. In other words, the results of these actions were inheritable. It's not all bad news, though. There are many ways to reverse to what flows of thoughts to your stressed brain. The most powerful weapons are exercise and meditation, which involves breathing deeply and being aware and focused on your surroundings. Both of these activities decrease your stress and increase the size of the hippocampus, thereby improving your memory. So don't feel defeated by the pressures of daily life. Get in control of your stress before it takes control of you. That is a powerful video. There were a few things that I want to point out that they said that I hope that you grabbed. I'd already mentioned, but I hope that you heard where they talked about that stress can actually shrink the brain, especially up here in the prefrontal cortex. And from that, that is where we, again, that filter is there. One of the things I grabbed onto was it makes it harder to learn and remember. Think about whenever you're under a tremendous amount of stress, and it's like, I cannot remember. What did I change my password to? Whatever it is, there's a reason that we're doing it. And I also thought it was so interesting in the DNA that this can be passed down. How we respond to stress can actually be part of our DNA. But then there was the good news, the good news that we can reverse this and that the two things that are best for reversing these effects, exercise, meditation, and what is what goes with both of those, deep breathing. So if we can do some of those deep breathing exercises because think about what you're doing when you're doing deep breathing you're pushing oxygenated blood up to the brain whether you are exercising or whether you are meditating or whether i'm just going to take a couple of minutes to make sure my shoulders are down here and not up here and i'm breathing in through my nose and out through my mouth it may be when i lay down to go to sleep at night but just the fact that we know that there's something that we can do that's actually pretty easy for us to do, that is good news. Stress relieving strategies, some other things that we can do. First thing right there, practice deep breathing, meditation. Set small goals. We can't. Here it is the first of the year. I hope one of your goals was not, I'm going to lose 100 pounds, but that it was something like, I'm going to lose 10 pounds. And I accomplished that goal, and I, I think I'll lose another 10. It's reframing it. Small goals, small achievable goals. Get that social support from friends and family. Find somebody who will just listen. Sometimes we don't need anyone who's going to try to fix it. We just need somebody who will listen. Exercising regularly, especially when stressed. Now, exercise doesn't mean you have to go out and run a mile. There's things you can do sitting in a chair. There's chair yoga. I even found something that was, it was like a chair Pilates. There's things that you can do that are very low impact. I mentioned aromatherapy earlier. There's something to it. Focusing on the positive aspects of your day. Finding something. Have a mantra wherever you are. I have them in my office. I use the serenity prayer a lot. And right in front of me, right in front of where I'm looking right now, on my wall, I have, 
you can do hard things. They make a difference. All right, let's look at depression. When you think about depression and you think about the symptoms of depression, I want you to think about what comes to mind. If we were together and I had you answering, most everybody will say something like sad. That's usually the number one answer is sad. You can actually be depressed and not be sad. It is the most common symptom, but there's over 20 common symptoms. We'll look at them. Psychiatry.org, the definition is common and serious medical illness. Medical. This is a medical problem. Yes, it falls under the umbrella of a mental illness, but this is a medical illness that negatively affects how you feel, the way you think, and how you act. Feelings of severe despondency, hopelessness, and dejection. It can happen at any age, but we often see it in adults. And we often see it in people just like this. I don't know if you really, if you recognize everybody that's on this train, but we've got some really famous people here, and they've talked about their depression, different types of depression, and we're going to look at the most common types of depression. But these are artists, and these are actors and actresses and singers and people that we look at and think, well, they must have a charmed life, but they struggle. Let's look at the signs and symptoms. And I encourage you, you've got these slides, to be really honest with yourself. I always say take a highlighter and go across these and just, let's just think back to, let's see, today's the, what, eighth, ninth? I can't even keep up with what day it is. Let's think back to Christmas, just the last few weeks. How many of these signs and symptoms have you honestly had in the last two or three weeks? And don't make up an excuse for it. Don't say, well, it's because it was the holiday. It was because it affects different people in different ways. And you may have had some of these things going on, but you didn't connect it to depression. Because again, depression has that stigma. That's why I'm so glad we do have celebrities that are starting to talk about it, to write about it in the books. Bruce Springsteen really talks a lot about his depression in his autobiography. And I've had people look at this list and say, yeah, but Holly, I'm a caregiver. Of course I had. Exactly. Caregiving and depression tend to go hand in hand and you notice some of the same things that are on this list for depression we just saw when we were talking about stress aches and pains digestive problems uh, difficulty making decisions sounds like these might tie together now I do want us to look at the Mayo Clinic talks about depressive symptoms in older adults and how it may look a little bit different. It is not a normal part of growing older, just like dementia is not a normal part of growing older, and it should never be taken lightly. Depression often goes undiagnosed and untreated in older adults because they may be reluctant to ask for help. Symptoms of depression may be different because... And again, look at the very first one here in older adults. It may show up as memory difficulties. And what will people say? Oh, they're just getting older. I bet they're just getting senile. And it could really be depression. What's my purpose? There's a lot of depression after retirement. We think that's what we're working for. That's what we're shooting for is retirement. And then we get retired. Wait a minute. What am I supposed to do? There's the physical aches and pains. And then this last bullet point is huge. Suicidal thinking, especially in men over the age of 75. There's statistics about 
white men over the age of 65 who they themselves have a diagnosis or a loved one has a diagnosis, the rates of suicide are very, very high. Let's look and see what depression does to the brain. Now, some of this is going to sound very similar to what we heard with stress. And looky here, here come these areas again, a hyperactive amygdala, feelings, emotions, fight, flight, freeze, fawn, smaller hippocampus. What do we say about that hippocampus where we convert our short-term memories over to long-term memories? Not having the same response to reward or not having that same response to what used to make me happy or bring me pleasure. And it doesn't seem to work the same way anymore. Now, here's some of the scans that I mentioned earlier. This is an actual PET scan. The one on the left is a depressed individual. The one on the right is not depressed. And what we're looking at here is decreased activity in the brain. I always talk about our brain lighting up. It literally does light up. This is a PET scan. And the things we can do to make it light up. Look at that depressed brain. Some of you have been there. I've been there. No wonder we're moving slower. We don't want to get out of bed. We can't make a decision. We feel like the weight of the world is on us. Look at the brain. Let's look at the most common types of depression. Because we are we don't just use, it's kind of like the word dementia. Dementia is an umbrella. There's over 130 different types of dementia. Well, depression is also an umbrella. There are different types of depression. And these are just the top five. There's a persistent chronic depressive disorder. Now, this is a depression that lasts for a minimum of two years. It's a major depression. It comes in bouts with periods that are a little less severe, but it's always there. So it can be uh, more severe and then it lightens up a little bit, but it's still there. That's why it's called chronic. You've probably heard of a postpartum depression. This is a major depression during or after delivery. And it is feelings most of the time of extreme sadness, anxiety, and exhaustion, where it makes it difficult for the mother to take care of herself or her newborn. This is not what is normally called the baby blues. There is a normal, due to hormone fluctuation, what called baby blues. This is much more than that. I mentioned earlier seasonal affective disorder. Sometimes that's just shortened to SAD. It is the onset of depression usually during the fall and winter, but it can happen in the spring and summer. But we see a lot more of it in fall and winter when the days are shorter, there's more overcast days, there may be more snowy, rainy, cloudy type days. We just don't have the natural sunlight. Usually people will even start to withdraw, gain weight, sleep more, and it returns year after year after year. I told you the two things that I use for this and that I recommend to people all the time is light therapy and aromatherapy. Got them both in my office right now. Those are things that you can find online. Then there is major depressive disorder. This is what is also called clinical depression. These are symptoms of depression that last most of the day for at least two weeks. And here's the other thing. They because of the symptoms, it's interfering with your ability to work, your ability to sleep, study, eat, et cetera. In other, in other words, your daily life. You might have one episode throughout your life, or you may have multiple episodes where you are having a major, you are in major depressive disorder. And this can last for a while. It can last for, a, I call it a season. It lasts for a season that we're going through. And then it can lift and it may never come back or it may be years before 
you have another one. And then there's also situational depression. This is whenever we are really sad. We are depressed because of a particular situation. I got fired. I've gone through a divorce. My loved one died. It's grief. Grief and depression can coexist. Of course they can. Grief comes in waves and self-esteem is usually maintained during situational depression. That's different with most of the other depressions. Self-esteem is usually maintained during situational depressions. Say that again, because situational depression, you're depressed because of the loss, the job loss, the relationship loss, the death. Lots of different types of depression. How do we get this diagnosed? To get a diagnosis of depression, the symptoms need to have been present for at least two weeks. I don't know that I've ever known anyone that had a depression diagnosis that they had not had their symptoms for a whole lot longer than two weeks before they finally went to the doctor. We can start at a primary care physician's office so that they can do a diagnostic exam. We do need to have complete blood work done because there are things that can be going on with us physically that can cause or even mimic depression. We need to do an interview with that doctor and be honest. When they come in, we only have a certain amount of time with the doctor and we can't sit there and say, I'm doing fine. Everything's okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm great. They can't read your mind. Thyroid issues and vitamin deficiencies can mimic depression. So that's why we need that blood work done. We need to honestly and seriously look at our medical and our family history, as well as cultural and environmental factors that are going on. At a psychiatrist, the psychiatrist can do a lot of the things the primary care physician does, but they specialize in mental health. They can perform therapy. They can also write prescriptions. They typically, though, will recommend that you go, they may write your prescriptions and see you like a doctor, but then send you out to somebody like me, who's a licensed therapist. So a licensed professional counselor, licensed clinical social workers, licensed master social workers, many of them also do depression assessments and instruments that we use to see if somebody is depressed. A psychologist can also do in-depth psychological testing. So there's ways to get diagnosed with depression. Now let's talk about treatment. You may remember when Naomi Judd committed suicide, her family came out and they said that they lost their mother to mental illness. And I've read her book. It's very, very powerful for she's honest about her struggle with depression, depression, treatment, resistant depression. But she does say that there were things that she did that helped reduce some of the symptoms. However, the good news is that in 80 to 90% of depression, it can be cured. There are things that we can do and the depression will go away. And even in those other 20%, there are things we can do to reduce the symptoms. And sometimes if we can reduce some of the symptoms, we get to feeling good enough that we can function. But the earlier we start the treatments, the more effective that it will be. We also have to remember there is not a one size fits all with depression. What works for one might not work for another. What tends to happen is we finally get so depressed, we end up at a doctor, we end up at a therapist, but we want it to work right now. And we don't give the therapy, we don't give the medication, we don't give the other treatments time. And depression usually doesn't come on all of a sudden. Situational depression can, because it can be an event that causes it. And it doesn't go away all of a sudden. And sometimes it takes trial and error. I want us to look at this 
chart about the severity of depression and some of the recommendations for treatments that we might see. And this particular chart has it from mild depression all the way to very severe. So for mild depression, some of the things that we might do is do a consultation, do some, and then I've got an entire slide where we're gonna look at other things, non-medical treatments for depression. Really becoming more educated and finding out things that we can do to help treat our mood, intervention, self-management, dysfunctional beliefs that we might have, learning how to reframe things, interpersonal problems. With moderate depression, that next step would be we're going to try those things that we tried with mild depression, and then a specific antidepressant treatment is probably going to be required. What's that going to look like? We may now use the medications, and we're going to talk specifically about medications in just a minute. Cognitive behavioral therapy is usually the first type of therapy that we try as well. For somebody who's having severe depression, and they didn't respond to the first or second step, this is where, again, we're going to do that combination of psychotherapy and antidepressants. We may talk about doing some inpatient treatment or some more intense outpatient treatment where someone's being seen two or three times a week rather than once a week or once every other week or even on a maintenance level of once a month. And then for very severe depression, we're going to recommend that we go inpatient. We are going to use a drug regimen. It's almost always necessary at this point. Psychotherapy, group therapy. And let's break each of these down a little bit more. Antidepressants, psychological support, and then non-medical treatments. And let's look at medications first with antidepressants. Antidepressants are not uppers. Antidepressants got a bad rap back in the 90s when with Prozac. Uh, some of you may remember that. There were even books written about it, all kinds of articles written about it. It's not uppers. Antidepressants usually do take two to four weeks to work. And usually you can start getting some type of relief in sleep, appetite, concentration within that first month. But for the full effect, it can take two to three months. And that's a long time. That's why often if we are going to go on an antidepressant, we're also going to recommend that we do some counseling or talk therapy. We don't ever want to stop taking any antidepressants just all of a sudden because we start feeling better. Had that happen to a lot of folks also. Or uh, let's say a caregiver, their loved one passes away. They get about 30 days out from the funeral or the celebration of life and they go, okay, you know what? I think I can come off of my antidepressants now. I'm just going to stop them. And they're not even through the first year. They're not through the first anniversary and the birthdays and the holidays and most everybody finds they need to stay on them for a little while longer. There are many, many different types of psychotherapy. This is just some of them that I've listed here. I'm sure you've heard of CBT or cognitive behavior therapy. This is where we focus on reframing. I do a lot of this in my support groups. I do a lot of this when I do one-on-one -on -one therapy sessions with caregivers how can we reframe this? It helps us realize that distorted thinking or negative thinking, or sometimes we might even call it twisted thinking patterns that we can get into. It helps us change our thoughts and behaviors and then respond to the challenges that are gonna come up in life in a more positive manner. There's also interpersonal therapy. And it most of the time, it kind of has a timeline of 12 to 16 weeks. And it focuses on that client relationship with others, as well as working through symptoms. And then there can also be something called problem-solving therapy, and that's designed to help manage negative stressful events in life. This is when we may be having, we're going to use more of the problem-solving therapy with that situational depression. 
So we're focusing on something that has come up and we're working through that. And again, this is just barely touching all the different types of therapy. I also do a th type of therapy called narrative therapy, where we use a person's story to build their therapy. I wrote a therapy called soul therapy, sacred end of life therapy to do with people at the end of their life. Many, many different types of therapy. Now, other things that we can do for depression. Exercise, number one. And when you are depressed, the last thing you want to do is exercise. Believe me, been there. But if we can just move a little bit, if during the commercials on TV, we can get one of those little, the bikes that sits there and we just pedal, 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 pedal with our arms and we just do it during commercials. Start walking to the mailbox and back a couple of times a day instead of just once. Something to just start moving. Little attainable goals. Gradual goals. Not immediate. We've got to set realistic gradual goals staying social finding that person that we trust when we are in the middle of a depressive episode we do not need to be making big important decisions trading cars buying new houses doing things like that educating ourselves more about stress depression anxiety all of them Taking great big large tasks and breaking them down. It's the same thing if you made those New Year's resolutions. The good thing is, keep this in mind also, it takes 28 to 30 days to make or break a habit. Instead of doing a New Year's resolution, I recommend that you just make or break a habit. If you need to stop sodas, get to that 28th, 30th day. It's going to be a whole lot easier. It won't be easy getting to the 28th or 30th day, but if we can stop something for 30 days, we can break the habit. Just like if we start for 30 days. So for 30 days, I'm going to come in here. I'm going to turn this happy light on. I'm going to put that aromatherapy on every day. I'm going to take some deep breaths several times a day. I'm going to set my alarm on my phone so that I stand up. I've, I've got a standing desk. I'm going to start standing during the day so that I don't just sit all day long. Those are little tiny gradual things that I can do every day and they add up and then something to avoid self-medicating and this is easy especially if it's what we were taught because somebody taught you how to take care of your physical body but who taught you how to take care of your emotional hygiene most of us, no one taught us. We learned it. We watched our parents. We watched other adults in our lives. Well, what if we watched them use alcohol, which is a depressant, or use food, or use drugs? We may do it too. Doesn't work. I've got another picture of a brain I want to show you. Another PET scan of a brain. A depressed brain. And this says a recovered brain. So there are things that we can do. There are things that we can do to take care of ourselves with depression. Some things we can do to help other people also offering support understanding patience and encouragement, knowing we can't fix another person's depression. And we, if we're the ones that has depression, we can't expect another person to fix it for us. We have to do the hard work. Talk about depression's part of grief. And as I'm doing grief therapy with people, I'm always saying we want to try to go under, over, or around it. We've got to go through it. We don't ever, ever ignore comments about suicide or maybe this place would just be better off if I wasn't here. Invite them to go on walks, outings, other activities, something with you. Encourage them to stay with their treatment plan. If it means getting them transportation, helping them 
get to an appointment and then continue to remind them that with time and treatment, that this will lift. Doesn't feel like it right now, but it will. Here's another scan that I found of a healthy brain and of a brain with chronic depression. And look at what's happening. And this is where we're going to get into some of the science, like we looked at with stress, that we now know about depression leading to dementia. Untreated depression can lead to dementia. We know this now. And it tends to lead to more of a vascular dementia because it damages the brain, the chemical changes that take place in the memory center of the brain. Also, another area that's damaged by depression is the conflict resolution center of the brain. Executive function and planning. And if you've ever been in a really deep depression, you know exactly what I'm talking about as far as being able to plan or even do things in a sequential order that makes sense. I want us to watch this. This is from Yale and it's on the neurobiology of depression. Again, it's about three minutes. The current standard of care for the treatment of depression is based on what we call the monoamine deficiency hypothesis, essentially presuming that one of three neurotransmitters in the brain is deficient or underactive. Neurotransmitters can be thought of as the chemical messengers within the brain. That's what helps with one cell in the brain you know, to pass that message along. But the reality is there are more than 100 neurotransmitters in the brain and billions of connections between neurons. So we know that that's a limited hypothesis. For decades, you thought that the primary pathology, the primary cause of depression was some abnormality in these neurotransmitters, specifically serotonin and norepinephrine. However, norepinephrine and serotonin did not seem to be able to account for the symptoms of depression in people with hypertension depression. Instead, the chemical messengers between the nerve sites in the higher sites involved in regulating mood and emotion, which include glutamate and GABA, were possibilities as alternative causes for the symptoms of depression. We know that these two, which are the most ubiquitous and abundant neurotransmitters in the brain, actually regulate how the brain is changing over time and adapting. When you are exposed to severe and chronic stress, like people experience when they have depression, you lose some of the connections between the nerve cells. And the communication in these circuits becomes inefficient, noisy, because of the noisy communication in the circuits involved in regulating mood and emotion. We think that the loss of these synaptic connections contributes to the biology of depression. It's critical to understand the neurobiology of depression and how the brain plays a role in that for two main reasons. One, it helps us understand how the disease develops and progresses. And we can start to target treatments based on that. There are clear differences between a healthy brain and a depressed brain. And the exciting thing is when you treat that depression effectively, the brain goes back to looking like a healthy brain. We recognize that the treatment for depression is a long-term process because for many people, depression is a long-term disorder. So we need new treatments. We've needed new ways to approach depression for people that haven't responded well to the prior treatment. We are in a new era of psychiatry. This is a paradigm shift away from 
a model of monoaminergic deficiency to a fuller understanding of the brain as a complex neurochemical organ. And again, there was some good news there. You heard them mention that key word again, communication. Communication between the nerve cells is affected whenever we are depressed. And it progresses. It gets worse if we don't treat it. But then you heard her saying, there's proof, there's research, there's studies now that show that with treatment, that brain goes back to looking like a healthy brain. We can treat it, but there's such a stigma over depression that people suffer. And now that we know that this can turn into dementia, we got to treat this. And like he said, it's a long-term treatment because other than situational depression that comes on because of a specific situation, for most of us, this was this came on over the course of weeks, months, years, a lifetime. And again, when I talk with the families, how many times I hear that mom had always been depressed. They never knew her to not be depressed. Did she receive any type of treatment for it? No. Maybe it's because we didn't know about depression. Maybe because we didn't talk about it. But we do now. I've got some resources here and I've got a few more slides where we're gonna look at some resources. Notice that I've start with that primary care physician. The National Institute of Mental Health Behavioral Health Treatment Service locator. Psychology Today is a place to find therapists, teletherapy, psychiatrist. You can actually go on psychologytoday.com and you can get so specific. You can put on one a female, that takes Blue Cross Blue Shield that is a Christian. You can get that specific and find a person in your area or who does teletherapy. The National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is on there as well. We've got resources for older adults who are depressed. And again, you're going to get copies of these. And I know not all of you are in Texas, not all of you are even in the United States, but we do have some resources here. If you are a caregiver of somebody who has dementia, there is an 800 number with the Alzheimer's Association. There is also an 800 number with the Area Agency on Aging. Some final thoughts, and I am leaving time on here because I see we've got some things in chat and I wanted to leave time for some questions. We encourage you to visit our YouTube channel. We've got a program on there called Stress Less with James L. West, and they are little 30-minute videos. If you type in our full name, James L. West Center for Dementia Care on YouTube, you'll find dozens of videos. And then also here in the United States, we have a new suicide and crisis lifeline. Just like we dial 911, if we have an emergency, you can dial 988 eight if there is a crisis and it is a lifeline it is free it is confidential and you can receive some counseling some prevention tips crisis resources uh, whenever you or a loved one is in distress i hope that you have found everything that we've talked about today beneficial maybe eye-opening you may not have heard of some of this but there are, there's more and more research about this every day. Here's our information at the West Center. If you ever need to get in touch with me or with Jamie, or if you're interested about learning more or talking more about any uh, dementia, stress, caregiving, depression, and I will have Jamie and or Marty pop back on. Here comes Jamie to talk again about CEUs while I look and see if we've got any questions in the chat. Yes, thank you, Holly. Again, Marty is going to be sending out a follow-up email within the next couple of days. In that email, there will be a link, a survey monkey link to complete an evaluation for our program. We do ask that everybody completes the evaluation. We really appreciate your feedback. But if you're wanting the one and a half CE credits, it's required that you complete that evaluation. And please allow us um, about four weeks to get all those CEUs processed and out to you in your email.
Thank you. Uh, Marty, did you have anything else to add? Yes, a couple of things. First of all, um, uh, please make sure you give um, Holly, I mean, uh, Jamie enough time or give them enough time to get those certificates to you. I know I, I get um, um, emails all the time asking about the CEUs and it just takes more time if it, um, you know, haven't responded to, to a lot of emails. So just if you could give her the four weeks after the 18th, that, um, we'd appreciate it. But if you don't get them by then, feel free to, to reach out to us. You'll also receive a, uh, a Google survey and that will give you um, an option to go to that when you log out of Zoom today. But if not, that will also be in the follow-up email as well. Um, there you go. We want to let you know about next month, but I also want to ask you, when you get the follow-up email, you have a link to the, to the flyer for next month. But if you also will see, we're doing a Spanish webinar with James L. West um, later this month. And if you guys, um, the link will be in there for that. Please share that with anybody you know that might benefit from that in Spanish. We're trying to um, to build up our audience um, um, in that area. So if you could help us, we'd certainly appreciate that. Great. Oh. I did see a couple of people. Um, somebody did ask, will we receive an email about the Spanish presentation, Marty? But that will be part of your email? In the follow-up email, in my follow-up emails, you'll see links at the bottom after the CEU stuff. You'll see links to a, a whole bunch of upcoming um, flyer links, and, and and that flyer link will be in that follow-up email. And that follow-up email will go out this afternoon for today's today's presentation. Thank you. I did see a couple of questions or comments about um, dementia and depression. It does go hand in hand, not just with the caregiver, but also with the people who the person who is diagnosed with depression, we tend to see it early in the disease as they have received a diagnosis of dementia. And so of course, a person would be depressed. Any type of a chronic illness that we get diagnosed with, we will we tend to see depression. That's with all of us. And then also we will see uh, caregivers of those with depression I mean, of those with dementia being very depressed throughout the course of the disease. Now, we'll also see a lot of depression or antidepressants used with people with dementia later in the disease because of what's happened in the brain, the brain changes. A person with dementia, their brain's actually dying, and it is going from about a three-pound brain down to a one-pound brain. And so there are so many brain chemical changes that many times they do end up on an antidepressant toward the end of the disease as well. Uh, let's see. I see some other stuff popping up. Um, Robbie, um, I, I'm not sure if you have a question. Your hand is raised, but if you have a question or comment, if you could put that in the chat or the Q and A, um, we'd appreciate that. Which population or race has more depression than any other? We do tend to see depression across uh, cultures, across race. We do, again, we see more. And again, we saw there's different types of depression. So I think also we would have to break that down and look at the different types of depression uh, to for me to really be able to um answer that and answer it accurately for you because it does it depends on the type of depression that there is but thank you for asking that you can also um, email me uh, if you've got some specifics that maybe I didn't touch on and I can do more research for you um, and I can get information back to you as well um so, uh, did you see the Q a did you guys did you answer that I did, and we don't have a future presentation on that topic. It's something that I can do some research on to get back with you, though. If you want to email me, my email is on the very last slide of um, this presentation. Thanks, everybody. And, and make sure you put in suggestions like that in the um, in the uh, evaluations you're going to complete. We ask for we'd love to have your input, and we and we ask for the, your your help with suggestions. Deborah, same thing. Um, that I asked with Robbie, if I, I see your name, that your hand is raised. Um, if you'll put whatever question or comment you might have in the chat or the Q and A, um, you know we've got two hundred and almost two hundred fifty people on here. It's really hard to start open up mics and um, and managing that. 
I do Thank see you. someone asking about ambiguous loss and how it relates to caregiver depression. We do have an entire program on ambiguous and anticipatory grief and loss. Ambiguous loss is when we are grieving the loss of somebody who is still alive. Ambiguous loss is, um, as it relates to dementia, we are losing a little bit of our relationship with them at a time. And so we mourn and grieve them. We don't always call it grief because people tend to associate grief with death, but we've got to change the mindset. Grief is loss. And so ambiguous loss, if we're, if we're talking about uh, dementia, again, we mourn the loss of the relationship the way it was. We can't stay focused there because we've got to land in the present and the way it is right now. But we do have to acknowledge and grieve the loss of the relationship the way it was. It's very, very real because we're also grieving the loss of the roles that that person played. For example, um, let's say something small. My loved one always uh, took care of the bills. Well, now I'm having to take care of the bills and I grieve the loss of that role. My loved one mowed the grass and now I'm having to mow the grass or hire someone to mow the grass and I grieve the loss of that role. But there's many, many, many. In fact, I did a program yesterday where we talked about ambiguous and anticipatory grief um, where we talked about truly even putting down on paper in my grief group, we list all the roles that our loved one played that either I'm now having to do or someone else is having to do. And that's real loss that's where the ambiguous comes from because it's not um it doesn't feel like we have a closure yes somebody just asked are you able to tell who i am we are your name comes up whenever you type did you see anything else jamie i do see something else yeah my mom's dying from kidney disease and is not always has not been diagnosed with dementia. Her memory and recall ability is declining quickly. Is there any different treatment between memory loss due to disease or dementia? That may be, especially if there is a disease, it may fall under like a vascular type dementia would be my first thought. Jamie, did you have any other type of thought? Because whenever somebody is having anything that affects the blood flow to the brain and they're having memory loss, that usually falls under vascular dementia. Um, the treatment isn't really any different. They just continue to treat the comorbidity or the kidney failure or the heart disease or the liver, you know, whatever it is that they might have. But because there's not a treatment for memory loss, there's not a treatment for uh, actual dementia, then um, it's not a separate treatment. Um, let's see. Um, um, for the person who asked about, and I'm not going to mention their name, because the, the person who asked about, can we see your name? I hope you're not intimidated to ask a question that you might have. And if you are, first of all, the, where you send it is to the, the hosts and the panelists. So it's just us that can see your name as opposed to sending it to everyone. But please, if you do have a question, feel free to email me or whatever, or, or, or Holly directly. Both, all that information will be in the um, in the follow-up email. Thank you. And I did see how does journaling gratitude impact depression? That is part of a treatment plan is journaling and journaling gratitude would most definitely be part of a treatment plan. Uh, I am a big believer in journaling and writing and uh, using, I actually ran off some feelings wheels today. If you've never seen a feelings wheel, um, I encourage you to Google that and use it with your journaling. It is fantastic and it helps you be able to really put a name on something instead of saying, I'm sad. It will help you dig down and find the terms and the words that you need to use to journal with and i've had some great great results with people who journal oh wow what are some things to do for dementia induced by alcohol yes there is a dementia that is an alcohol induced dementia the first thing we want to do is start trying to get off of the alcohol lots of times we have to uh, do that in stages and we have to start getting a little bit tricky ourselves as caregivers where maybe we're mixing the non-alcoholic with the alcoholic till we kind of start to wean them off. It depends on um, 
it, it can be very, very specific. This is another one. If you want to reach out to me, we've got a, a program that we do that's specific to alcohol-induced dementia, and I can send you that. So if you'll reach out to me at hglover at jameslwest.org, I can actually send you that information. All righty. Um. One of the things I'll say about CEUs, uh, somebody asked to make sure I send them the, um, and they gave us uh, the email address um, to send them the, the survey. And also, please make sure when you're, when you're watching these for CEUs, it's really important that you, that you register on your own and log in as yourself, because that's where we get the, the, the feedback or the, the report from Zoom that tells us who was on, and we have to have that to back up. Um, if we were ever audited on the CEU. So please make sure you um, you do that. I know sometimes you're new and you don't know that, but please try to do that in the future. And I'll, I'll try to get that to you. Somebody then, was asking about the happy light and there's the happy light right there. Here's mine. That's why I turned my background off. So mine, here's the back of it and it has settings and I ordered it on Amazon. And no, I do not own this company. I wish I did, but I encourage people to get happy. <laughs> this is just the name of the brand. There's all kinds of them out there. You can just type in light therapy. I use this one because you can adjust the um, lights and you can adjust the time on it. So that's what I use. Happy light. Uh, after you, after you first did that the first time, I have two of them. <laughs> Once you, after I saw your first pre presentation, I do. I, and the, I, I bought two, di two different kinds, but they're great. They are and, good. And I encourage people who have a loved one that has dementia to get their happy light also and just turn it on while you're sitting at the breakfast table um, and make up some kind of story about it. This is my new light or whatever it was. Um, let me see. Is this There's a couple of them still coming up. Dementia and a blood cancer died of sepsis. Questions. I'd like to know what kind of dementia she had. Uh, let's see. If you were her power of attorney, you probably can go back and get into um, her health records or request them, um, especially with a death certificate. You can go in and you can ask probably without even a power of attorney because um, that's where I would start. I would go back and say, uh, you know, here's the death certificate. I'm the child and I'm wanting to get for my own information I'm wanting to get information about mm -hmm. the type of dementia that my parent had how close to delight does one have to sit to get benefits it really does now you don't want it like I've got mine just right here mine's within an arm's length but you don't and you sure don't want to look right into it <laughs> you can just have it sitting I know Jamie's is sitting like yours is on the table isn't it yeah yeah it's about three feet four four feet away no five, six feet away. <laughs> and it, it works for me. And there's someone who says six to 25 inches is what it says in the instruction. So I think it's different for everybody. It also depends on the time. Jamie's in a room that doesn't have any windows. So she's enclosed and we keep her in a little cage. You back keep me in a prison back here. So <laughs> I've got windows as well. Uh, well, thank you, everybody. I sure Holly, appreciate being on. Just, I'm sorry, Holly, just exceptional as oh. always. Just really exceptional, and, and and you see in the comments, and um, and Jamie and Holly, thank you so much for partnering with us to be, to do this. Um, it's just great when when you can watch the chat and the people ask questions and the people giving you information of how much it helped them. That's real, and thank you for doing that, y'all. And I, I thank you all for joining us. Um, we sure to appreciate it, and please look forward to the follow up email, and please help us with that Spanish one if you're able to. Thank you so very much. Y'all have a great day. See y'all next time. Thank y'all. Bye. Thank you.